Welcome to a very exciting episode of Experience Focus Leaders. I'm delighted to introduce you to Pamela Wilson, a leading voice in marketing and the author of two books on content marketing, Master Content Marketing and Master Content Strategy. But the best part is that Pamela is actually a practicing, living, breathing CMO at DCS. Pamela, welcome to the pod. Thank you so much, Alex. It's great to be here. I can't wait. Pamela, we wearing all our hats. We, we are enabling content marketing. We are creating content marketing together with you right now. We have a technology that I've developed through Relay2 that digitizes content for B2B world in particular. So what I'd love to hear is what's your take on the state of the art in content marketing in AI world that we live in today? versus five years ago. What has changed? What's changing at a pace that you didn't expect? Or what has remained the same? You know, it's really funny because uh, everybody is up in arms about AI and its impact on content marketing. I think that there are so many exciting things that we can use AI for. I do think that we have to be a little bit careful. I've said from the very beginning, from when ChatGPT was first released, that after playing with it a little bit, what I saw was the results were a little bit like what you would get from an intern who's had way too much caffeine. So an over-caffeinated intern, they work fast, but maybe they're not very accurate, right? And you need to provide guidance so that you can get the best from that person. And that's the way... AI behaves. You can get some interesting ideas from it, but it definitely needs human guidance. That said, we use it, we weave it into our entire production process where I work now at DCS. And I always say, I would challenge you to find it because what we try to do is we weave it into different parts of the process, but then we go in and leave our human fingerprints all over the final product. It makes everything move faster but we make sure that we're that the final product is definitely human created and has our tone of voice it has our subject matter experts quotes from our clients real numbers things that ai tools really don't have access to and so for example when you say tone of voice is, are you achieving that manually or are you introducing a series of prompts um for example when it comes to text generation or to visual content generation how, how are you doing that? Because I think that's something that we struggle with to keep consistent. And I yes. wonder if you found the miracle cure. The, the person to really listen to on this is Andy Crestadina of Orbit Media. Okay. He has published some amazing content about creating a customer avatar using AI and then how you can apply that customer avatar to get better results from AI. So I don't pretend to know everything Andy does. He's really smart mm -hmm. about it. But what we have done is basically we feed it information about our customers. We get what it spits out, basically, and then we edit it really heavily. What I find is that AI tends to be full of hyperbole. It's yeah. very flowery. It tends to, it has some like verbal tics that it tends to use. So if you ask it to write an email, it's almost a guarantee that the email will start with something along the lines of, I hope this message finds you well. <laughs> mm, mm. And whenever someone sends me an email like that, I'm like, oh, hello, robot. <laughs> yeah. You're starting to notice these to. emails, right? Like they yes. pseudo scrape your name from somewhere and like pseudo repeat regurgitate what your company does and then right. go into their shtick, which is completely generic. And it feels like, who do you take me for almost moments, right? And so that that's the... The really challenging part is like, where does this, where's the right magic where like you do automate certain things that do personalize them, but bring in something beyond uh, just a, a copy. Have you found right. ways to move people with more than text in, in your recent experiments? Yeah, we invested pretty heavily in video. A couple of years ago, we actually have a staff of videographers, so what we're doing is looking at our content and deciding which of the pieces we're about to publish, 
would make for great video. So we look for ways to incorporate that video into our content. It's posted within the blog post, and then we take ex excerpts and put that on social media. So we are very like video forward and the videos feature our own people. They feature our own customers. So this is stuff that AI cannot create. Yeah, it does not look generic. It's definitely only ours. And that has really been a strength of our content, I think, all along that we incorporated that years ago. The company was smart and invested in that. How do you make videos accessible? One of the things that I am increasingly realizing is, especially kind of running a pod and like you're constantly asked to consume lots of long form video. And it's great if it fits right in the sweet spot of like where you're most interested in and you're like, okay, I'm going to block away and I'm going to spend the 20, 30 minutes. A lot of content, you don't have the time for that. And so the right. podcasts are now doing little quick controversial snippets to get you interested. But that's just one snippet. Like it's not like the foundation of an hour. Typically, we're thinking a lot about like how video needs to become a little bit more like a document where you could get to the right parts and not have to read every page and every letter, but you could skip around intelligently. What have you been finding in making the longer form video format accessible? We are not doing that much longer form video, actually. I know yeah. on YouTube, for example, right now, if you want to monetize your channel, your videos need to be at least eight minutes long in order for them to insert ads in the video. But we're a B2B marketing department, so we are not really concerned with monetizing our YouTube channel. We want to reach our prospects with our YouTube videos. So they're short. They might be three or four minutes. Sometimes they're only two minutes. We try right. to get to the point really quickly. And then we'll take excerpts that are even shorter. Sometimes those are 30 to 45 seconds. And we put those on social and try to drive people to the full video and the full blog post. So the shorts end up almost being like ads for the content. They they give somebody like a really juicy tidbit from the concepts that are covered in our blog posts. And then they get people to go in and consume the larger point. We do mix it up, though, because we do webinars. So those webinars are 25, 30 minutes long, and they're more like an educational type video where if somebody is actually interested in the topic, they can do a deep dive and really understand the end of the content. So it's definitely a mix of links. Got it. And what you what would you say for that busy person, right, the busy B2B person that we, we can come back to how do you get them to recognize and know your brand? Because I know you have some creative ideas there. But what are you doing at the very beginning, right? Was that maybe what's that snippet that gets them interested to get the person really excited and motivated to look more, right? You literally looking through the longer episode and trying to find the juiciest bites and bits from that. Do you have some tools that are doing that? How are you experimenting around this? It feels like we're fighting a lot of inertia in B2B world. And I, we we can't be, we have limited number of people we could experiment on because our audience is probably limited. And you can't take crazy risks on the one hand, but if you don't take any risks, you end up being in the status quo. I'm curious what you found as ways to experiment and interrupt people and get them to pay attention to Pamela's content. Yeah, I think it's a little bit of understanding who you're trying to reach with each individual piece of content. And if you've read my books, I talk about beginner, intermediate, and advanced audiences. And the beginner audience is really just trying to understand the topic that you create content around. They know next to nothing. They're trying to define it, trying to understand the basics about it. And they really, that's a kind of audience you do need to just grab their attention and say, hey, we have a solution. You should pay attention to this. So that's where you're using things like a very compelling first sentence in your video or in your blog post. You are potentially like taking them into the middle of a story that's in progress and that's get, that gets their attention. And you're just trying to engage. That's the main thing you want to do with that audience and trying to bring them into your ecosystem to a certain extent. And then you mm -hmm. have the intermediate audience 
that knows enough about your topic that they're trying to figure out, like, how can I actually apply this topic? How can I use it? So their questions are very how to. So blog posts or videos that start with how to, how to do this, how to accomplish this, how to achieve this, that tends to really engage that audience. And then the advanced audience is about to buy. So they need to understand things like, let's compare the vendors that are available in this industry and get details about the features that each one offers, or let's look at pricing. Mm -hmm. They're really much further along that buyer journey. And for that audience, you do want to have more in-depth content that they can use really as a research source as they're making that buying decision. Yeah, actually, I'm going to quote your book. A seismic shift has happened in marketing. Consumers now hold the power during the purchasing process. Instead of waiting to see which ad catches their attention, they search for answers proactively. They arm themselves with information so they can make a qualified buying decision. So it feels like that's the sort of motivated, educated consumer that knows that they already have a problem and they don't want to be talking in the B2B context to a sales rep or going through a discovery call and all that jazz, right? Like they want to get to the meat and meat of the solution and, and maybe do have that call, but when they're much more educated, is, this, is that the shift right. that you've been seeing? Absolutely. And uh, you want to hear something wild? I actually wrote that sentence in 2016. Mm. So how much more true is it today than when I wrote it? I've been doing marketing for long enough that even just this idea of let's go to a website or let's search the web and figure out who we're going to work with based on the websites that we found That was new in 2016. That was still relatively new. Now people are using AI tools to find that kind of buying information that they need. So tools like Perplexity AI Mm -hmm. and even the chat GPTs and Claude's of the world are helping to inform B2B buyers about who they should be considering for those buying decisions that they're researching. So showing up in those tools is actually becoming really important as well. Great plug for Perplexity. One of our guests was Chief Business Officer of Perplexity. Also happens to be my brother. I do agree that they're like really for very busy folks, they are becoming a great entry point where how do I do the search so I could save time and then get, still get the sources and credible, uh, credible information. I, what I really think is so great about perplexity. And I I think Google is going to have to watch out, honestly, because it's very efficient. You go there, ask a question, you get all of these answers that are very well organized. They're cited with links so that you can find the original source. And our company happens to be showing up really highly in perplexity. We're doing really well there. And I think it's because our content has been structured. We have more than 400 pieces of content. I think it's up to about 450 now on the website. Yeah. And it's always been structured in a way that's very easy to extract the main points from. Perplexity seems to love the content at DCS, and that's been really good for us. I think as the time goes on, that's going to become more and more important because people are not just using AI tools to research what they should the companies they should look at. But I think eventually they're going to be using AI tools to actually make some of the decisions for them. I really think that's where we're going, especially for maybe smaller buying decisions. It's Wouldn't it be great to go to a tool and say, Here's my I need criteria. XYZ. Here's what I, need. Yeah. I need XYZ. I don't want to pay more than this. Find me the answer and sign me up. Maybe they have your credit card and they can plug it right in. It's just, I think there's so much potential coming down the line that as content marketers, we need to be thinking about how we're showing up in search engines today. But I think for the future, we need to think about how our content is structured so that it can be used in these AI tools that will be more and more used for buying decisions in the future. It's really interesting. We both are in the health and insurance universe. And for some of you, directly, we serve some customers there, as we were discussing earlier. And so what I'm noticing, and maybe you have similar examples, is in the, for example, purchase decisions around employee benefits. To our surprise, 
some of the wildest fans of our AI capabilities are in this uni- in this universe, and they could be carriers, brokers, HR personnel that supports questions for employees and the employees themselves. And they're basically, when they have all the policies and all the documentation that's available to them is in a, inside a benefits hub, they want to know, right? Like, where am I going to get my best coverage for fertility benefits? And then they don't want to just go and get an answer like fertility, blah, blah, blah. They want to go get to the right document in a library of 50, get to the right page in that document or maybe it's multiple documents, and then get there in the context and then read the before, the after, get the full story. Very similar notion to what you're described as perplexity, right? Because there's references and deep links to the content because the answer from AI is good, but you're not going to, I'm not going to trust it completely. But in effect, I could delegate 80% of the search and decision-making and finding the right way for me to navigate through complexity. And it feels that more and more buyer behavior is shifting in that direction. And I'm curious, when you brought up perplexity and the fact that you're well structured and searched there, is are you starting to measure like the tra- percentage of traffic that's coming in? Or is it still an innovative space that's interesting? And obviously we're talking about it, but it's still in terms of volume, it's a margin margin of error on Google. And, I, and it's funny, places. Alex, I don't, maybe you can connect me with a person who knows how to do this. I'm not sure exactly how to determine what's coming in from perplexity. I don't know. My inkling would be that it might be a small percentage right now, just because of the industry we're serving. I don't know how much they're using those tools to research providers, but I do see it growing in the future. I just think it's going to be more widely accepted. I consider myself pretty savvy about these things. I was one of the first people that in my own world, at least to try chat GPT, it was like within a week of it coming out. So I've always been, I'm an early starter with those kinds of tools. And I don't want to assume that our audience is as well. So even within the people that I know, I don't know a lot of people who are using those tools to make these kinds of B2B buying decisions, but I, it's pretty obvious that things are going in that direction. Going in that direction. Yeah. Certainly for perplexity fans, if you're selling to venture capitalists, they like to talk about it. So you could, that's what we, we do see that. But I uh, didn't know. Sh- yeah, yeah. But if you sh- shift gears, Pamela, and we, we go back to some things that are not changing, and that's, let's say, a reason for annoyance in, in the world of uh, B2B marketing, what would you describe things that you really hate about? Uh, the B2B world that's stuck in, like it's not moving with the consumer times and it's hurting itself, stepping in its own, on its own toes when with some of the techniques that we just get habituated to. Yeah, I think it's such a shame that we are still having this conversation, but this is one thing that AI has actually made significantly worse. When I first started out with content marketing, The first year I even attempted to do any kind of content marketing was 2010, so 14 years ago at the time we're recording this. And back in those days, they used to talk about content mills and how people were hiring inexperienced writers to just basically generate words that they would put up as a blog post. And there was this attitude that it was almost like, it doesn't matter as long as it's got the keywords in it. It doesn't matter if it's good, if it's engaging, if it's if it actually uh, builds trust because it's completely accurate, if it's worth reading. Like none of that seemed to matter. It was just we like just publish traffic. a bunch of words just, on your we web. Traffic. Yeah, just yeah. bring in traffic, publish yeah. frequently. Doesn't The quality doesn't matter. Yeah. And that was an issue way back then. And now with the ease of just churning out random words that we have yeah. with AI tools, I think it's significantly worse. I hope all of my competitors are doing exactly that (laughs) because we're doing the exact opposite of that. I think for people who are willing to put in the work that it takes, and it's not impossible work, it Mm -hmm. it can be done. I, I lay out this whole process in the books that I wrote, but for people who are willing to be deliberate about it and careful about the way they create their content and thoughtful 
I think there's so much opportunity and people who are just publishing random words without really being concerned with quality. It's just a huge missed opportunity. And it makes the rest of us who are actually trying to publish high quality content look bad, right? right. In a way, although if they're your competitors, then you look good. So I, please, I don't know do where that, yeah. I land on that. But yeah, but it's surprising to me that is still happening. I think I think people are understanding more and more that it is crucial to build trust with the audience that visits your website and to show them that you actually know what you're talking about. And that's something that high quality content does beautifully. I think this is what's fundamental to how we looked at the content world. Like the best marketers are taking what the best teachers or best sales executives do. And that is they build an interactive trust-based relationship was an audience and part of the trust is hey maybe this is not a fit for you or this is our point of view there's other points of view like helping people come on a journey not not be bombarded in some sort of a monologue about widgets and things like that and it feels like the best marketers are packing in the talents of the best educators and sellers and then the best sellers and educators increasingly need to up their game in terms of maybe visual communication, simplifying the message, because then there's a lot of noise. It's like you were saying, like the mills are working full time and now it was AI generated stuff overheating. So th what's your take on that, that missing step, right? Like it is, it feels like the people at the mills wouldn't know sales rep that's world-class at an enterprise company if their life depended on it. They're just doing something completely different. Yeah. One of the things that I am so grateful that we have access to is we have a really tight relationship with the sales team at DCS. So mm -hmm. they are constantly feeding us the questions and the objections that they're hearing when they're talking to prospects. And they feed us an objection and it turns into a blog post. And mm -hmm. it is... It ends up being some of the best content that we create, this content that directly answers a question or a fear that they have or something that's holding them back from committing to working with us, right? That ends up being some of the best content. And then the other content that tends to perform well is comparison type content where we list all of our benefits, but we list our competitors as well so that people who are researching can hit that blog post or hit that video and in one place learn about all of the competitors and do a comparison right there. And of course, the bonus is they're doing that comparison on your website, right? right. So right. you have a chance to show them everything that you can do in the ecosystem where you've built the content. And so this is what you're describing some of the best performing content, interestingly, is much more in the later stage of the buyer journey, which is historically the SEO machine is not as, it tries to pick up some of that, but it tends to like focus quite a bit on top of the funnel. Is that kind of an accurate? Uh, yes, absolutely. And that's not to say, so we have a lot of content that generates traffic. Yeah, We're on HubSpot, so we can actually tie content to deals. And so we have hub we have traffic that we see in HubSpot that has gotten us views on the website that has not led to deals. And then we have other posts that have led directly to deals to a, a lot of deals, some of them. We have one piece of content that we published at the beginning of 2023 that has generated, I think it's 144 deals. We were looking at it just the other day. It's if you hit on the right topic. It, it's, it can be astounding, but I, I was in an executive meeting just this last week and I was saying it's a little bit like playing baseball. Like you have to go up to the bat and swing a lot of times. And then every once in a while you hit this huge home run and you, it, but you don't really know ahead of time, which posts are going to do that. So in order to discover which ones will be big hits, you have to publish, you have to consistently publish really high quality content. And if anything, worst case scenario, you just get really good at creating high quality content as you go along. So this challenge around discovery and the volume ties really well 
was another theme that we see, which is gates, lead, mag, lead magnets, and then the kind of the gating requirements around that. So you've obviously seen the evolution in the marketing world of how when tools like Marketo and HubSpot and Eloqua came out, that was the thing to do. Now there's a different philosophy to removing gates, right? Or delaying, delaying some of that request until later. What's your take on what is the current best practice? And does it vary significantly by the customer kind of stage, right? This kind of advanced customer versus a beginner. Guide people because I, th- I think there's a lot of confusion. A lot of people have anxiety. Am I gating it too much? Am I not gating enough? And I think that would be lovely for our audience to hear your expert perspective. I think it has to be a mix, really. In the early days, if you can create some really juicy, helpful PDFs or webinars or something that people want to get access to when they're in that beginning learning stage, if you can put those behind a gate... Now, granted, most things are out in the open, right? But you put some really awesome, useful things behind a gate that allows you to then engage with those leads when they're in that beginning stage so that you can educate them and nurture them and just help to move them along that buying decision. So I can see a place for that in a, again, in a limited way. So it's part of a larger system where you're really giving most of it away for free. Mm -hmm. But one thing that we do, for example, and this is not a new idea. It's something that I've used for years, but once a month, we publish a post on the website and we add what's called what we call a content upgrade. So it's basically something that takes the content to the next step. So maybe we share five tips in the blog post and we have 10 more in this content upgrade. And it's about a topic our audience is interested in. And we get people signing up for that content upgrade that allows us to identify, oh, this group of people that signed up for this content upgrade, they are struggling with this topic because they wanted more information about it. So it helps us mm-hmm. to identify what the lead is most interested in and just to continue to nurture them. I do think that as they get closer to a buyer decision, though, you need to take away as much friction, friction. as you can. Mm-hmm. Just make it mm-hmm. super easy. Okay, you've been we've been helping educate you and now... It's time for you to either indicate that you want this or to schedule a call with our sales team. And we want to make it super easy. It's like going down a slide. Whoop, just slip down that slide and make make that appointment so that we can have a conversation. That's fascinating. I actually see sometimes people do the opposite, right? They re- freeload the front stuff, educational stuff, and then because they think the late stage stuff was more valuable they lead capture it, but it it makes sense because you're the friction that you brought up, the topic of friction, it is insane. I don't yeah. know what statistics you've seen, like when you're doing the research for the books, but I'm seeing like 95% drop off all yeah. the way to 99. Think about that. Yeah. And so that feels insane, right? Like you really got to have a volume compensate for that drop off and you really have to have your nurturing strategy worked out to to the finesse to make up for that deficit what are you what are your thoughts on that yeah you we've all seen these forms right where it's like you said a super valuable piece of information and they want your name, your address, your phone number, the social, name of your first born child. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. like the name of your pet and what color vehicle and model do you drive? And yeah, it's they want all of this information. And you're right. If you are trying to make a buying decision, it's typically because you have a pain point and you are feeling the challenge and you've gotten over that, like you said, inertia. Yeah. of not making a decision and you're in this mindset like I I need to fix this. You don't want to fill out a mile long form. You just want to maybe talk to somebody so you can make a decision today, right? And I love so it. There's I, some marketing tools, right? Like I'm part of this industry, but I, I hate some of these tricks. They think, oh, yeah. we're going to be very clever and we're going to make it feel like you just fill out an email. And yes. then the moment you fill in your email, it opens oh, up. Oh, this and, open yeah. form opens up. And we're yeah. like, I read Cialdini. I know about commitment and consistency. And I, you're going to fill out the rest of the form, including your mm-hmm. child's firstborn neighbor. And, and, and I'm thinking back to your words about trust. 
what are you doing? What are you yeah. doing? You're just like shooting yourself in the... You think you're a clever marketer, but you're... And I think it, one company does it and lots of other people see it and think, oh, this must be the way we do this now, right? Yeah. yeah. And people are not using their common sense. And th just thinking about the experience the prospect is going through and the mindset they might be in when they are really at the point that they need a solution, you can't make it hard for them to find the solution. It's closing a door and locking it in front of the salesperson who wants to talk to them. It doesn't make sense to me. So my philosophy is find a way to nurture people at the beginning, give them plenty of free information, but put out some nice, I like to call it bait, right? Because yeah, we're fishing yeah. for leads, right? So you yeah. put out some nice bait that people might really be interested in. See if you can get at least some people signing up for that so that you can nurture them. And then just continue to engage over time. And then once it's time for them to buy, wow, you want to make that as easy as possible. Right. And so I, I will just, again, you're the expert, right? But I will describe what I think is it still would say relatively state of the art B2B process on some of these, let's say late stage or middle of the funnel gatings. So you got this form, either super long to begin with or trying to trick you. Right. Okay. Then I get the form. Thank you. You'll get an email from us, like type of thing. I'm like, yeah. really? Do you think yeah. I want to go and start fishing out in my spam folder your email mm -hmm. right now? Okay. Let's assume I'm really motivated. Then I get that email. Let's say I got it. It's a link to download a PDF, right? If it's a sales rep or Somebody kind of bleed gen, it is a PDF, but let's say it's a link to download PDF, which takes me completely out of the equation. I think if I'm on my phone, but it probably, if I'm really motivated and I still have my attention and I found this email, I will download it. And then what we see is if, especially if it's one of those long form, like quality foundational assets, it should have many pages. And guess what? There is maybe like a nice cover right? But there is no real navigation. You would see, here's a table of contents, but it's not even clickable. And then yeah. you, you right? like, it, it's so, I, that's right? such a pet peeve of mine. Yeah. Right. Like it's like, yeah. what? <laughs> have you heard yeah. about the internet? I have like, a background like... in publication design. So yeah, I see these PDFs and I'm like, oh my gosh, it's just not a good look. It's not, you're not building trust. You're not impressing your audience. It's just such a lost opportunity when you just dump a bunch of words into a PDF and make people fill out a huge long form to get access to it. It's I've seen very well done PDFs. They yeah. can be well done, but it done has well. to be thoughtful. It's just like the long form content. It has to be thoughtful. It has to be careful. You're, you need to put your best foot forward every step of the way if you want it to accomplish what you're trying to accomplish. So, so let's, let's keep going. So you're, we're like, you know, how do you say, I'm more used to saying a sister from another, you're like a sister from another mother. I don't know. I don't know what's the right <laughs> saying, but, but so this is to me, music to my ears because it's, it just mind boggles us. We're a little bit outsiders, insiders, but I'm looking at this and I'm saying, okay, so now I have to, I have this, whatever, 40 pages, let's say it's great content. But let, it's not AI, it's like thoughtful things, but I, I have to get to page 29. How am I going to get there? So I have to click through this thing and then... You're going to click 29 times. 29 That's how times. you're going to get there, That's Alex. how am I going to get there? I'm like, okay. Yeah. All right. So I'm motivated, but obviously, again, on the phone, I'm already out, but I'm like motivated right. on this page 29. And then the page 29 has the goods, right? It has what yes. I need. But then if I, it's an average PDF, it does not have a call to action for me to do anything on that page that would take me to the one thing I want to do. Like we talk about agents, all AI agents, like for crying out loud, just put a call to action, forget an agent. Yeah. Like you're like a call to action is an agent of a stone era agent that you're not using that actually right. drives you to go see the video testimonial in full, like we were saying, or et cetera. And I'd say, again, great marketers do this, or we're fortunate to work with Salesforce and we see that they they put beautiful stuff. But then the reason, the, the kind of challenge is if it still is in PDF, you're going to leave the 
that may be one yes. of the reasons why they yeah. don't do it. It's not it, that I don't want I don't want I want you to stay in the PDF. And the moment you leave, you're out because you're right. opening you're going outside of to a different software, right? You're going into your browser and in your browser you probably have 50 tabs to 100 tabs depends on the day, right? I don't know about you, but it's I have extra work to clean it up and then you you have to then switch out, right, etc. Or if you're going to YouTube, you're in the browser and then you're going to watch distractions from the latest political ads or yeah, angry people right. promoting a cause and you're like whatever brand association you have was this b2b provider is probably going out the door so one of the things that we found really interesting is if you could take that nuggets all of that and create an immersive experience right like immersive call to actions immersive videos immersive case studies and that's our approach to solving it but i'm curious what else are you seeing people do to improve that experience right like we've talked about navigation already what else what if anything is it like trying to do interactive content assets that don't take you in pdfs right effectively you know any I, advice would be helpful yeah again it's a mix but some of it is super low tech for example i talked about those content upgrades Early on when we decided to do that, I set up a template in a Google Doc, believe it or not. And the Google Doc template uses our fonts, uses our colors, has our branding on it. And in the footer of the Google Doc is a little small call to action so that people can book a call with our sales team. Every single page of that content upgrade has that little message and link in the footer. Because like you said, they might be most interested in page 29. You want them to be able to see the call to action no matter where they are. So it's such a small thing, but it's really important. And then on our website, part of our site design really is to build in easy to click calls to action that are very visible in the header and the footer all over. The moment somebody finally jumps off the fence and wants to make a decision to speak with us, it takes them no time to find where they can book a call. I think this is genius because again, like if we take away even from the marketing for a second and look at an average presentation, like sales presentation, that is often sent as a leaf behind, it like is sent, you will not see a call to action in an average presentation. I would say what, 95% of the time? Uh, you will yeah. have thank you. You will have thank you. The most right. sophisticated people will have some sort of QR code, but it just feels like such a missed opportunity. If, if you have content that could be consumed increasingly when you're not there in the room, or even if you are in the room, right? Like you want somebody to go and do something, go to your site, go to sign up to whatever it is that you're talking about. And so I, what I, what my only conclusion on this, and you tell me if I'm missing this, is that people stress about the content, right? The good ones, right? Like they they worry, they do a lot of legwork and the research. They dress for the, they take a shower the day they present, right? Like they do their hair, they, they maybe even practice the delivery. But right. there's something in human nature that tends to run like a 100 foot race in the Olympics, right? You're running, training, you got to 95 uh, or 95 meters, right? And then you're, just stop. And you're like, okay, I'm almost there. I could see the end, right? I'm not going to care about this, the last five meters or the last mile, whatever is the thing. And it, it just, I can't put a finger on it, but it, it seems like a prevalent, prevalent challenge, right? Unless it's your, like you said, you put in the template that thinks about that, right? Because like, why am I doing this document? I right. want people to talk to us. And what, what, I'm curious if you've seen this pattern in content creators where they're just okay. bringing it to the end. Yeah, I've seen the pattern so much, Alex, that I actually, there's something that I say that helps people to remember, which is, if you do not include a call to action at the end, what you have created is content. It's not content marketing. It becomes content marketing when you include a call to action at the end. Otherwise, you're just publishing content, just putting things out into the world that are not meant to actually market the business you're publishing it for. So the call to action is what turns it into content marketing. 
I had shivers going down my spine. Maybe that tells you that I'm excited about what we're talking about. And I'm totally geeking out, but you're, you know, this is a great phrasing. I wish I had come up with that on my own, but I'm going to borrow what you just said and, and attribute you, Pamela. It's your C's, of course. <laughs> so I, I think a related category, I, the best quote I've heard, or like it's allegedly, alleged Steve Jobs quote, but it, he was talking to his team on a product that they were building. And he said something along the lines of, you guys baked a beautiful cake, but for frosting, you covered it with dog shit. And it was, it's a very visceral kind of imagery, right? Like we're we're remembering, but it's really powerful, that reminder that why do we love the feeling of opening an Apple product? The very first touch point of that, like the texture. It's special from the very beginning. Something, right? Beginning to end. They they put the there's thought in that right like in the yeah. it's it's not just the branding up front and and it's tactile it's experiential and I think somehow people forget that the content is product right it's they think it's content like you said and the subs and there's a sort of a, a separately like there's this thinking if I write the two hundred pages it means that it's good and everybody's gonna read it but right. like why has there been 500 years of book cover industry and like book design industry to to get good ideas across. Probably the judge by cover concept is there for a reason. I don't know. What's your take on that? The first impression part of content. The first impression is crucial. And honestly, in the content world, that's usually either the way you lead into your podcast episode or the way you lead into your video, it's the first sentence that you say on screen or in a blog post, it's something like the headline and the first sentence of your blog post. You're trying to get their attention and keep them engaged in the content long enough that they'll just keep reading and keep consuming it. So it is super important. The call to action is what needs to be there at the end but they'll never make it to the end if they haven't started at the beginning, right? So you have to get that beginning piece right as well. It's crucial. And that's why one of the smartest things that you can do if you are nervous about using AI is just ask it to generate 50 headlines for you. Mm. And I guarantee 49 of them will be terrible. Or 48 of them will be terrible, but one will have some phrasing in one piece and another will have some phrasing in another that if you put those two pieces together, you will have an amazing headline. You can tell it what keywords you're trying to make sure are in the headline. And just in my books, I've recommended that people do this, that they write 25 to 50 headline ideas before they actually choose the one they're going to use. AI makes that really easy. AI, again, it's that caffeinated intern. It can generate a lot of headlines. Most of them will be bad, but there will be a couple of gems. And when you understand what motivates people to take action, like any good marketer does, Mm -hmm. then you can recognize those gems when you see them or recombine a couple of pieces and put them together so that you get just what you need. But that headline and first sentence are crucial. I couldn't agree more. And I would say if you take the other side of the marketing equation, which is the visual side, right? And we, you brought up in the video segment. So there's a reason why people work so hard on B-rolls, right? There is a reason there's these brand positioning projects that are expensive and, and well done. And yet, so people do that. They have this amazing feeling. I'm excited. Like we obviously see before we hear or before we before we read anything. So it's the very first subconscious impression hitting into our crocodile brain. And yet, here's like a low-hanging fruit. Add a B-roll to, and again, we can, this is a technology-enabled thing, but it's just maybe you can do this manually. We have we, we see people do it with our tool and they love it. And so that's why I wanted to share this as a nugget. It's add either the pre-done background that fits into your narrative and your story or your corporate B-roll. Add it as a kind of background filter to your text. And immediately it brings something to life. It feels you care about the audience right. experience, right? It feels it's special enough to not just have a PDF, but have a... Kind of maybe there's a substance there, but there's also like 
style and there's an emotion and you can't help it. You like, if something inspires awe, if something is mesmerizing, these are foundational things that get us op- to open up, to be open to new ideas, right? We want to be excited about something that's coming. And it sounds basic, right, in some ways, and yet it's really rarely done. And I'm curious when your takes, so whether it's the oppy dimension that you talked about, like really nailing the hook, so to speak, and or this visual element of that, the visual hook, so to speak, why are people not spending the cycle? Do you think it's just because there's a sort of assumption, like I'm really smart, my ideas are good, and they will speak for themselves? Is it that we're not trained enough in this? Is it that there is, there's not enough emphasis in the industry on this? Like people don't listen enough to you? What, what's preventing people from getting that focus? I, it's so, it's funny because I find that question actually really difficult to answer because to me it is so obvious that you have to hook someone from the very beginning. And so it, it boggles my mind why people don't understand that. It's if you and I are walking down the street of a town we'd never been to before and we're both hungry and we see three restaurants in a row. One of them has the front door shut and we can't really see in the windows. We can't tell even what kind of restaurant it is. It has this generic name. And um, the next one, maybe the doors are open. We can see inside, but it's a little hard to tell. But then the third one has this sign on the street that shows the menu and shows today's specials and has this funny message on the top, tells you what kind of food is on the inside. The doors are wide open and there's someone's outside the entrance available to answer any questions. Guess where we're going to eat lunch? (laughs) I'm getting We're hungry go to just the listening third to you. I'm getting hungry. It's, just, okay. <laughs> I, it's That's what our content needs to do. You have to pull people in from the very beginning, people who are busy and who literally have their hands on, on whatever they use to click on their touchpad or whatever, their mouse, they are ready to leave. And so you have to grab them with something that tells them what they're going to get and why they should pay attention. And that's your headline in your first sentence. So it's it's wild to me that people, it seems so so basic. I, I don't really understand why people don't do it. Well, if there are competitors, me. I'm happy they don't do it. Yeah. But <laughs> Well, Pamela, I can't thank you enough for the time today. You grabbed me, you grabbed our audience. I'm sure we, there's some real wake up calls for people at, if they're not doing some of these things that we just discussed. Where can people learn more about your publishing work, your company? What's the best way to connect with you? If they want to find me and my books, I'm at PamelaWilson.com. I have my name on the internet. So that's a place to go to learn about my books and maybe read more of the kinds of content that I have published on that site. But where I'm working actively is DentalClaimSupport.com. That's the business I work for dental financial industry, very niche audience, but we are putting all of this content, all of these tips and and techniques that we talked about today, we're putting those to use on our website and getting a lot of leads every week from the content that we publish. So if anyone wants to see this in action, dentalclaimsupport.com is a great place to visit. Amazing. Pamela, thank you so much for sharing your insights with us. Thank you.